So thank you all for coming. I really appreciate showing up to uh, hear about vintage 1960s technology. <laughs> um, I, I work at Clearwater Analytics. My name's John Conti. And for the last 10 years, I've been working in the area of data. And uh, it's generated a lot of failure. I can honestly say that a tremendous number of my ideas have been bad ideas. And it, it's been tough to kind of shovel through it. But of course, you know, failure does lead to learning. And along the way, I've been picking up more and more basically old school technology. And I thought I understood it. And along the way, I learned that I didn't actually understand it, that it was a it was a more interesting beast than I gave it credit for. So uh, this talk is about REPL-driven development. And this is probably the most valuable piece of old school technology I have found in my, uh, in my travels over the last couple of years. And I want to share it with you today. Um, it has an interesting theory and an interesting history, um, which hopefully will help you understand why it may be able to help you and give you some ideas on uh, how to do that. So first of all, as some of you may know, uh, a REPL is an abbreviation for Read, Eval, Print, Loop. And it's not a complicated piece of software, at least the primary pieces, there are three. And the idea is, you know, you read in some code and you execute it and then you say what happened. I think we're all pretty, pretty familiar with what that means. I'm going to refer often to closure throughout this because closure in particular has a REPL, that's the code for it on the screen, uh, where the read representation, the evaluate representation, and the print representation are all the same. And that's a big deal. And you'll see why as we uh, meander through this story why that is. So there are a lot of REPLs today, right? So everyone has interacted with a REPL at least once, uh, probably a lot more than once. Uh, maybe you've spent some, some quality time. And they all have different philosophies and different twists on the way things work. But the idea is that they're immediate. They offer immediate feedback. They examine the state of a system as it is running. And they don't require um, a previous notion of what it can do. In other words, you're typing code and seeing the results, generating new hypotheses, and then immediately jumping right back into code. And that, that immediacy and that implanting into the environment is what's really important about a rebel. Oh, maybe that doesn't work. OK, that doesn't work anymore. So um, as I promised, this is really old school. Even in the uh, days of oops, didn't start my timer. Even in the days of punch cards and teletypes, basically you were immediately getting feedback and immediately putting feedback into the machine. So this made the style of computing where you showed up at the, at the terminal, and of course this is why Oracle is called Oracle, and you asked it questions. This uh, lovely red box down here is, uh, is an Amdahl machine. And that desk there, it weighed about like 300 pounds. I mean, you couldn't even move it. And a bunch of them came with giant red buttons, like big industrial buttons It was like, an emergency turn off button. I remember asking the installer, why do you need a giant emergency turn off button? You know, wouldn't control C work, you know? So um, the idea behind these things was that you went to the pond of data and you sat down at the Oracle and you asked it questions, and it told you answers. And there were special priests of the oracle that prepared everything for you. They were called operators. And they wore snuggies because machine rooms were very cold. And you know this, this was the way it was. Uh, 
and then something happened, you know, uh, change, a radical form of cheap change. This is like the mammal of the computing world compared with the dinosaur. So this overran the planet and computers became small. And instead of a pond of data, we ended up with pond after pond after pond after pond of data. And this changed our industry as programmers. In particular, it made shrink wrap software a thing. And no longer were there operators running software who were highly skilled, knew the quirks of what was going on, and could help users achieve their aims. Now the user was on their own, sitting in front of their little pond of data, and everything was expected to work. It had, you had to put in a key, turn it, and everything was going to work great. And as an industry, that wasn't what we were delivering in the 80s and early 90s. In the 80s, and what, what basically we were asked to do is, well, software's now a moonshot, right? You, you, you make it all together, and then, you know, you, you light it up. And so you need all these specialized little pieces and you've got to manufacture them to tolerances. You need all this stuff and then you need to fit it together just right. And then you need to wheel it out into production or put it in its little case and give it to Amazon to sell to someone and light it up. And hopefully everything goes great because if it doesn't, game over. Right? You know, you, you don't get to ship turnkey software and explode when you get there. That they just return it and they're done. Right? So the response of the software industry was a bunch of new static languages, in particular C and Java, but it doesn't matter. The whole idea was to try to generate more guarantees at compile time and give the programmer more information up front about what wasn't going to work. Along with this came big frameworks, completely tested kits where you could load this stuff into your software and if you tied it together with all the right stuff and you had a tool to do it with, um, you would get a system that had some guarantees, some properties that you could count on when it got into the field so that you could predict better that your rocket was going to end up in space uh, instead of in a fireball, right? And, and so this was valuable. And it led to a lot of dollars being harvested from the software market. And so that's really the software market that we know and sometimes love today. Well, of course, change happened again. Um, all those little lakes started running together. Uh, at first the internet was, you know, not connected to most computers. But very soon people started creating services on the internet that people could actually use and that they became reliant on. And that started to look a lot more like a utility. You know, this you know, if I put my stuff in Google Docs and it isn't there, that's a big deal. And if it isn't there, Google probably has a very large problem. In other words, I'm probably one of millions of people uh, for whom the lights went out. They also have a real scale problem. They have this enormous pool of data. And the problem with this kind of scale isn't just the quantity, which might happen in any system with performance guarantees. But in fact, the diversity of data was pretty much guaranteed to be out of the box, right? So if there was an edge case, it was going to get found, right? So they had a different kind of thing. And uh, strangely, um, more static guarantees did not lead to the problems of those utility services being solved. It was hard to fix scaling, but it was also hard to it was also hard to fix the problem of 
the 1% of data that you never saw that showed up as soon as the thing hit the internet. And no amount of te telemetry or early testing helped you with that 1%. That 1% wasn't, wasn't known. If it was known, it'd be solved. But it wasn't known until it got out there. And telemetry, you had to know the question that you wanted to ask before the event happened. So chances are you don't know how to ask that question because it's about the 1% of the data that's going to break your system. So that's not very fun. And the users were not impressed, right? So when there was an outage, you know, at Twitter, Google, you know, everybody knew, right? So you failed in a very obvious way that, that very quickly destroyed your reputation in a way that was hard to rebuild. Right. Um, and what we saw in the programming world is we started to see dynamic computing the way it had existed come roaring back. And, 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 and this is in a whole bunch of different ways. This is by far not representative. Because even if you're working in, in Java or a static language, you saw a lot more configuration coming in, whether it was services like Zookeeper, which injected the parameters which started, or database connections that were dynamic, or there was a lot more dynamism in every system at every level. But the languages started to change too. We started to move away from static systems because the guarantees they gave us weren't solving the problems that we were having when our software was a utility because we had to wait until the problem happened and react. And this is when I started learning playing with our data because we're not in a pond, we're sitting in a huge ocean. And every morning, this was my, in fact, my first lesson at Clearwater taught by the guy in the Hawaiian shirt. And I was saying, we don't have test coverage on this system. And he said, it doesn't matter because we, doesn't, we don't know what's going to break us or even what's going to show up over the wire. We need to let it happen, and then we need to react appropriately. Well, that's a different game. That's a quick reaction, thought-based, competitive game where the internet is trying to break you and you're trying to survive. And uh, that doesn't feel at all like rocket science. So it's interesting because this thought-based competitive game has quite a bit of theory about it because, of course, quite a bit of money has been spent on it. Um, and, uh, but the theory is interesting. And in fact, it dominates financial thinking and uh, all kinds of domains after this. So it's its, its own story. And it begins with this guy. This is Genghis John. Genghis John it was Colonel John Boyd. He uh, was a fighter pilot, and he taught at the famous fighter weapons school. Uh, he had an outstanding bet that he could beat any student within 40 seconds from a disadvantaged position. He formulated a theory of engagement called energy maneuverability theory and proved its validity using simulation and data science. This is like in the 50s and 60s. He was a little ahead of his time. He was very intense. He was not popular, hence Genghis John. He was able to expand on that theory with a working model. This is the model he created called the OODA loop, Observe, Orient, Decide, Act. Now, you'll hear about this everywhere. It's tremendously overused. And my overlay of a uh, REPL at the top isn't the only possible way to lay out a REPL on this. But it really starts to point out that uh, decision making has some fundamental properties that we all do, and that um, uh, to optimize decision making involves optimization of a couple different things, as well as complete information at a couple different things. And 
EM theory showed that a highly performing decision maker with a vehicle capable of rapidly enacting action would prevail against superior forces. And the way to design that vehicle was to use the OODA loop to make the decision maker able to understand their situation and the critical, critical, critical step is to orient that information, to integrate the external model with the internal model, decide what to do, and enact it without delay. Um, he and his group uh, became known as the Fighter Mafia. The Mafia advocated systems built around the concept of agility. In other words, complexity, power, uh, all the other characteristics that we often think of as being useful in a system were sidelined to the concept of agility. And of course, we know in our world today uh, that that has a lot of ramifications for business, decision making, um, not just competitive, uh, the competitive stage of uh, of maybe war fighting. And from his work, a whole bunch of information came out. And he had some lessons for us. Number one is agility is old school. Simple would always outperform complex if implemented correctly with respect to the domain. In other words, if you matched a simple technology to the outside problem correctly, you were done. And no matter what anyone else had that was more complicated, they weren't going to be able to apply that quicker than you could, which means you were going to win. Two, decisions must be data driven. Data is not information, however. Information is data presented as it will be used. So orienting is hard. Merging outside data with our internal model is hard. So we need data presented to us in the manner in which we can fold it into our internal model. And that's not just a, a, a sea of numbers or a sea of gauges or something like that. That's purpose-built uh, information displays and fusion. Lesson three. Integrating external info with an internal model is the hardest job the decision maker will, will make. And it's the critical bottleneck. Make it as direct as possible. In other words, implement information laid over reality, period. Lesson four, come to the playing field preloaded with tools and reference data. You can't figure out what you need later. You need it now. Lesson five, remove every last bit of delay. A system should have zero resistance to change. Once a decision is enacted, the action should follow the decision as quickly as possible. Time is of the essence. If we act quicker, there's lots of problems that we we fix by default. Now, of course, we know this, right? We do this every day. And this is the Clearwater Swiss Army knife. Uh, we build reports. We figure out what's wrong. We do ops. We do everything in the world with this thing. But this is not an application development environment. So. What do we need to do to get closer to our problems? What do we need to do to take the backlogs that we have and turn them into appropriate quick actions? In other words, if we look at our business, are we able to react to the requirements of our market at the speed that the market wants us to change? I think a useful measure of that is the length of a backlog. So, for those of you with short backlogs, maybe you're in the wrong talk. Well, we have our data, right? You know, we can, we can get data from the internet and from our own systems easy breezy. But after that, 
we're kind of in a moonshot situation, aren't we? So what, what could we do if we wanted to turn that around, to maybe use a little bit of old school stuff and bring it all the way into the future? Well, of course, we want to go way into the future. So here are some of the ways that maybe we could apply some of this technology and get ourselves to a new place. Um, the first thing we need to be able to do is to jack in. And nowadays, that's just not very hard, right? Networking is ubiquitous. And yet, connecting to a machine with, say, a debugger seems complicated. And once you get a debugger, of course, you have to stop the software. That's not very helpful. And you have to find what you want, which might mean stepping through stuff. We can't do that. In fact, what we need to do is we need to connect directly to the environment. And once we get there, we need to have a command interpreter, which allows us to directly use the parts of the system to examine the system itself. And we need to be able to do that no matter where the system is. If it's on my desk, if it's in dev, if it's in prod. Obviously, we need safeguards on prod. You don't want to go there by accident. But other than that, when there is a problem in production, that is where it needs to be debugged, because that's where the problem is. So we need to be able to jack in. And that's that input part. Once, once we get the input, we need to be able to start to display data. We need the read step. So right now, with lots of languages and lots of data marshaling formats, you, know, you can't get a hold of the data that's coming into the system. You can't see in a simple way uh, what the data is. You know, if you've got a database connection and you've got a row mapper and you're producing all these POJOs, how do you display this data? How do you get a hold of the connection and say, what is coming through this connection that's got this service so irritated? And you need to be able to uh, represent those problems and then use those representations to run it back through your code quickly. In other words, testing isn't something that's done off in a framework. Testing is something that needs to be done right when you're debugging the problem. So you need to be able to take this information in, and you need to be able to do things like say, well, if I change it this way and run it back through the code, does that, does that really fix my problem? I need to be able to do those interactive experiments. And of course, that's exactly what things like SQL and a REPL allow you to do. So after you've got this data in, you have, uh, Oops. You have the impressive problem of orienting. And orienting is about taking the raw data and maneuvering it into something that's information. And so this, I've been showing various REPLs all for closure. This particular one has a visualization environment sort of tagged along with it. But uh, in Clojure's case, it runs on the JVM, so whatever shows your problem, whatever displays your problem, whatever helps orient toward the system that you need to look at is what you need in the environment. So I was talking with Gary the other day, and I, I remembered the name of this old system. It was M Milnir, the big hammer of Thor. And we had to build a purpose tool to go in and stuff data to deliver NAIC reports. Well, you know, that's kind of interesting. But again, you have to preload. You have to pre-prepare. You have to pre-develop for what the problem is. That doesn't help with the 1%. What we really need to be able to do is to be able to show up with a, a tool bag that's very appropriate to the domain and rapidly turn data into information. And this, of course, includes bringing reference data into the tools so that we know uh, uh, all, the, all the background that we need to know. So the next thing we need to do is uh, we need to decide. So if we have uh, the data, we need to formulate a, 
a course of action. And of course, for human beings, this is going to involve generating a hypothesis and ex doing experiments to determine if a particular idealized course of action might yield the result that we want. Well, this kind of experimentation is very hard when you're sitting on the sidelines with a bunch of telemetry and your rocket has exploded, right? You have a bunch of little bits and pieces and you have traces. And uh, if you know anything about rocket explosions, typically you don't get to hear about why the rocket exploded right after it exploded. You get to hear about it months later because what they have to do is they have to infer from the data likely causes they have to eliminate painstakingly theories that can't be true given other data, and even, eventually they have to hone it down to the smallest possible set. Well, you know, if your internet service is going to be down for a month while you figure out what's going on, that's not helpful. And so, you know, maybe that's extreme, but that's the situation we're in when we destabilize a code base by implementing new features. That's exactly the situation we're in, and that's exactly why it takes a long time to ship it. Mostly because we have to sit on the sidelines while it fails, instead of stay in the flow of the system and debug the system from the perspective of the system itself. And of course, in the end, we must act. And when we act, um, what Colonel Boyd taught us is delay is our enemy. The faster we can act, the less damage problems make, and usually the smaller the action required to remedy whatever the problem is. So in this particular screen recording, I cut some code, and I checked version manager to see what was going on, and then I check in the code, I watch the build from the REPL, I deploy it from the REPL, I watch the logs from the REPL, I check the status from the REPL. So before I go at the end of the night, I have already shipped all the way through my pipeline the code of the day. Now it might still have problems, but it runs all its tests and it runs in an environment and it is visible to other teams which need it, which means if there's something I haven't thought of, quite likely that 1%, I'm going to hear the scream the next morning, which is when I need to hear it. Because that way, I move down the wrong path for only a short period of time before I get tripped up and brought back to center and taught about that 1%. So I think if we start moving back into the dynamic world. You know, we of course can move into whatever the next problem is, which will be, you know, interesting. And in fact, um, we have a lot of exciting opportunities. You know, when the last generation of static languages were made, uh, we did not put together software by composing huge pre-install software packages. You couldn't just go get Kafka, plug it in through an interface with a service that you had and give it a try. You couldn't just change implementations and gears the way you can now. There wasn't a huge ecosystem of software, a huge catalog of software available to try in a moment's notice. In many ways, we need this dynamism to give us access to the market that we now have of all these free things to try. So for instance, this is a closure REPL embedded in the Unity 3D game environment. And so the person is sitting in Unity in the same environment that the, that the customer will eventually play a game, and they're running the REPL that's manipulating the environment that Unity will use. Well, this is all assembled from off-the-shelf parts, right? I mean, I'm not saying that this system, Arcadia, is simple and or that the developers aren't really talented, but before, just constructing something like this from libraries, that was like, that was a corporate-sized event. This is two dudes with closure 
and unity. I mean, this is just a, an amazing level of composition and availability. So we have an opportunity uh, that didn't exist when many of our languages, systems, and methodologies were created. And in fact, the internet is going to bring all of this to our competitors as well as to us. So I, I'm going to take off the gloves here a little bit. You can construct a REPL out of Groovy, JavaScript, and they'll be useful. They'll be really useful. And you can build tools based on those things, and that's fantastic. Um, I highly advise it if you're into that sort of thing. But if you want immediate results, Clojure will give it to you. It directly serializes and deserializes all the data that you'll find in a JVM. And it makes all the software that's available from Java available to uh, Clojure. And then it allows you to construct in terms of plain data, and it gives you the simplest, most direct REPL in the world. Uh, and so I think that probably if you want to follow uh, uh, a faster development methodology, there's, there's no choice but closure in the JVM environment. Um, so I would advocate it uh, unconditionally. Uh, let's see. Well, that's it for me. Hopefully, um, I've at least entertained. Um, and, hope, and if you're interested in trying any of this, uh, I don't know, uh, get in touch with me. I'm happy to help. Um, it might hurt. It might help. Who knows? Um, any questions? Yeah? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Uh, is it possible to tie Clojure into an existing Java app or a Clojure REPL? So uh, there's a neat project on GitHub called uh, Live REPL, and it uses the agent interface to inject the Clojure jar directly into an already running JVM process. So you can do that from the command line. You can also use it through JMX. So you don't even have to restart the machine. It's kind of an amazing little thing. And it has a little bit of library code that uh, caters to Tomcat, which allows you to start a REPL in the class loader of one of Tomcat's applications. So that's an example of a, if you go look at the code, it's tiny, of, of a, a very fancy integration that's super easy to put together. So I would say that um, you know, total time to get a REPL into a Java project uh, where you have the source code might be you know, less than an hour. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it that you all came to listen. And um, if there's anything I can do to help out, please let me know. Thank you. <laughs>